All right, let's get started. Thanks, Cora. So I see recording has started. I'm going to switch to our presentation. Give it a moment to load. All right, can you all see the slides? Perfect. Okay, so welcome to the session on cross-tenant user data migration and exchange online. It's nice to see some familiar names and faces in the attendees list. We know that many of you have firsthand and extensive experience uh, living through uh, using Microsoft tools when your companies are going through mergers, acquisitions, and investitures. So some of today's material will be um, familiar, and we definitely have some new things to cover today as well. And we recognize that cross-tenant migration is about a lot more than exchange. So we'll talk a little bit more about related areas on our roadmap as well, even though this is an exchange conference. But most of the what we'll show today will be directly related to exchange or messaging. So uh, before we get into the material, I'd like to welcome my co-presenters as well. Uh, first of all, I'm Rob. I'm a product manager focused on M365 scenarios, um, cross-tenant migration, multi-tenant organizations, and data residency are some of the areas that our team covers. But I'd like to let uh, Georgia and Estelle introduce themselves as well. Hello, I'm Georgia Huggins. I'm a product manager for M365. And um, I work on the cross-tenant mailbox mig migration product, as well as sort of our roadmap and our um, plans for our, our suite migration in the future. Nice to see you all today. Hi, um, my name is Estelle, and I work on domain sharing feature for complex organization scenarios. Welcome. Thanks both. So today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the high level business scenarios that drive data migration. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of you, we know that you have experience in this and we look, we really like to make this session interactive as possible. So please feel free to type in the chat your thoughts as we talk about this. Then we'll go into the product roadmap and I, I think here's where you'll see some um, interesting and new information that you might not have seen before, at least not publicly. Uh, then we're going to give a demo of domain sharing for email working with mailbox migration. So this is new. We haven't shown this publicly before. It's uh, hot off the press and in private preview. So you, you'll be able to learn a little bit more about that scenario. And then we'll do a deep dive on domain sharing for email um, so that we can explain a little bit more about how that works as well as a feature. So first of all, let's talk about the high level scenarios. Um, there's three that I'm going to cover and I'm, I'm experimenting with a poll here. Let's see if I can reopen it uh, while I'm talking. Okay, so we're interested in your experiences in these areas and you feel free to type as well. Um, the first one that I'll cover is direct cross-company data migration. We Anecdotally, we see our customers needing to do this uh, sometimes. And this is where, in this example, we have Contoso Limited selling its electronics division to Fabricam. And so what needs to happen is that just the assets related to the Contoso Electronics division need to get transferred directly to Fabricam. And with direct cross-company migration, what we've seen typically is that there's a real focus on speed of migration because from a business perspective, Contos and Fabricam will have something, they'll have a transition of services agreement, which has tight timelines. And um, so we see, you know, you, you probably have to work over a few really busy weekends to get this done and then ties are severed. And, um, there's not really a need for long-term coexistence after the migration is complete, and there's probably less emphasis on coexistence while the migration is happening. This is a scenario we'll demo for you later with domain sharing, as I mentioned. 
The second business scenario, which anecdotally, we lately we've been helping a lot of customers with this one uh, and, and tend to see it more because I think it gives flexibility in planning is when, in this case, Contoso knows it's going to divest its uh, electronics division ahead of time. So it will spin up a separate tenant for Contoso Electronics and migrate data into that separate tenant in preparation for a handover. And then when it comes time to make the deal with Fabricam, the whole tenant is essentially handed over to Fabricam. And now this is interesting because Fabricam has a decision to make, right? Do I keep Contoso separate? Do I consolidate? In this example today, uh, Fabricam is deciding to consolidate, so they need to migrate Contoso Electronics users and data into the Fabricam environment. And um, in this case, it, it, what's interesting is you may have a more prolonged uh, coexistence period, especially on the Fabricam side, because any you know once they've got the whole tenant, it's really up to them how um, quick they want to consolidate, right? And so what we see here is that often the coexistence experience is comes to the forefront and you really have a lot of needs for users to coexist and be able to work together before the migration happens. And if we zoom into this, uh, as a multi-tenant organization, imagine Fabricam doesn't decide to consolidate Contoso Electronics on day immediately. They may choose to operate separately for quite some time. Uh, so here, obviously, the uh, need for collaboration will persist indefinitely. And this is where we see the same features that you require for migration coexistence tend to be the features that you would need for indefinite multi-tenant organizations as well. And so it's a common feature set that you'll see across all of these scenarios that will um, give you tools that you need in order to um, combine them the right way for the scenario that you're working on. Uh, in this case, cross-tenant migration may well be relevant uh, indefinitely too, because users move back and forth, customers reorganize. There's other reasons to migrate users and data other than just uh, to fulfill the initial needs of a merger, acquisition, or divestiture. So those are some key high-level scenarios. We haven't drawn them all. Another one we've seen is that sometimes in a merger, the lar a larger tenant will win or one of the tenants will win, or sometimes if two, two customers are merging together, they may go into a third tenant. So again, it's the same set of features and technologies that um, are useful in all these scenarios. So thanks for the submissions to the poll. It's interesting um, just on the fly that direct cross-tenant migration, uh, and most of you have experience in that. So uh, appreciate your feedback. At this point, I'm going to hand over the discussion to Georgia, who's going to talk us through the product roadmap. Uh, and then following that, we'll see a demo. Thanks, Rob. Um, so you can add. Thank you. Um, so, OK, before I get into the roadmap, I'd like to first talk about Microsoft's approach to cross-tenant data migration. Um, but actually, even before that, I would really like to acknowledge our partners that have been in this space for quite some time, providing services and solutions for cross-tenant migration. These products really have nice UIs. They offer a variety of features and options to move your data. But in many cases, however, these products were built upon APIs that weren't necessarily designed for cross-tenant migration. So that is where we come in. Our first party data migration product priorities were really defined to solve the problems in the space that only Microsoft can. So these areas include performance, security and compliance, as well as platform integration and functionality. So performance. While tenant data migration in almost all cases will require movement of the actual content from one physical location in the service to another, our product doesn't require any tertiary or temporary location. So for example, when we move messages with our MRS infrastructure, we see on average a throughput of one gigabyte per hour per mailbox. And so if you multiply that by the concurrency of the moves in progress, say 300, um, you could see up to 300 gigabyte per hour of mailbox data being migrated. And OneDrive is even faster. Security and compliance. 
So like I mentioned previously, because our data migration does not require any content to be exported and re-imported into the service, the data never has to leave the boundaries of the service, nor does it require sharing credentials between two different tenants. So each tenant admin can be responsible for their own set of configuration steps and authorizing what resources can be migrated when. So platform integration. While you may notice that individual workload capabilities and features are being released to previews incrementally, our goal really is that all of our data migration and experience solutions will work together to provide the best possible cross tenant migration experience for both our end users and our tenant admins alike. Now I will move on to our roadmap. Okay. So now we're going to talk about a roadmap for cross tenant data migration and supporting features. Um, but even before that, the very first thing that I want to call out here today is that for the first time we are officially announcing that we are releasing our product called cross tenant user data migration to general availability by the end of this year. In partnership with SharePoint OneDrive for Business, this product re release will include both cross tenant mailbox migration and cross-tenant OneDrive migration for users. So while the architecture and existing prerequisites behind these features will not be significantly different than what consists in our previews today, for Exchange Mailbox migration at GA, we're now going to support the migration of auxiliary archive mailboxes, and we're even including new commandlets available for monitoring the status of each aux archive mailbox being migrated. OneDrive will also be supporting larger five terabyte and example OneDrive migrations. If you would like more information about the cross tenant data migration for OneDrive, stay tuned for Ignite. So these two features together will be included in a single add-on license for most plans. The add-on license will be available for purchase via your account manager channels. A single license will support one user's mailbox and OneDrive migration to another tenant. Um, move backs in the event of an emergency or an error uh, will also be supported for that single user license. So in addition to our user data migration product, we're also working to build solutions to support cross-tenant shared data migrations. So SharePoint, one, um, SharePoint site migrations are currently available in a private preview, and we're actively working on our design for Teams chat and Teams meeting migrations. So M365 groups, Teams, and channels, they're also next on our roadmap as well. Another effort or area that we're also driving to improve is the overall cross-tenant migration experience for both the tenant admins and the end users migrating, of course. Domain sharing for email, which will be available in public preview soon, and a feature that we will be showcasing in our demo today, enables a single email branding experience that could be implemented on day one of a merger or acquisition, and then supports migrating of mailboxes after. Identity mapping is a new preview available to make it easier to update the user object in preparation for the mailbox move. This feature slash service will eventually underpin most of the identity and object mapping tasks to support migration of data for both user and shared in the future. So also coming to preview soon is our first Microsoft Admin UI experience for um, configuring your tenants for cross-tenant mailbox migration. So for those of you who have gone through our existing PowerShell uh, based experience or process, the one that is publicly posted on Docs, this will be a much simpler experience. I'm very excited about this. Um, and then eventually the OneDrive setup and config will be added to this preview experience as well. So we're also investing in a solution that will allow tenant admins to configure Azure B2B for end users to enable access to resources in both the source and target tenants when a longer migration or transition is required. And then finally, from a roadmap perspective, our, our end state is going to be su to support like an orchestrated migration of Exchange Online, OneDrive, SharePoint sites, groups, teams, and chats, everything our entire suite. But until then, you will likely see previews of each individual experience becoming available so we can enable feedback and product improvement as soon as possible. This is really where I want to call out a big thank you Thank you to those of you who have participated in our active previews because really 
the feedback that has been provided is invaluable and has really made a difference in the products that we're, we're building. So thank you there. So high level data migration process. Um, at a high level, the typical cross tenant data migration process with some of our products that are available today could be something like this. So first you could use domain sharing for email to share a domain that will either be moving with your users or say a new domain that is assigned to the users migrating to the new company. So after that, you would establish a trust relationship for content migration. For example, the trust process for mailbox migration would be to first create the Azure app for authorizing mailbox migrations in the target tenant, and then creating an org relationship object on both sides and a migration endpoint in the target tenant. Next, you would need to create new identities, or this could happen before. In your target tenant, because we will need to map those users to users in your source tenant. The source and target tenant identities uh, are mapped with workload specific attributes to allow your services to make the, the match between the source identity and uh, the target identity. So after the identity mapping process takes place, you will need to create, submit, monitor, and complete migration batches of users such as mailboxes. And the final stage of your migration after all users have been migrated, and in some, in some cases, you'll want to cut over domains and eventually remove the trust configurations from, from both tenants. Um, so now that I've talked about like what is coming in the typical migration process, process, excuse me, it's time to really demonstrate a few of these exchange capabilities together. What I have explained, I understand and I realize that there may be a lot of nuances and steps to each merger acquisition or divestiture that could require a different set of steps. These are just a high level um, overview. But in our demo today, uh, the scenario for direct cross company data migration that we will be showcasing, um, we will be showcasing how domain sharing for email and cross tenant mailbox migration can be used together to brand your users um, on day one as a single company and then subsequently move mailboxes during this coexistence period. So in this scenario, um, Contosa sells its electronic division to Fabricam and then needs to migrate those users to Fabricam. I'm very excited, so let's get started. Thanks, Georgia. I'm going to click ahead to the demo. There is sound recorded, and it worked in the, the, the pre-session, so please give us a thumbs up if you can hear the sound so that we know it's working. Today, we will show you a demo on domain sharing and mailbox migration coexistence. Fabraham acquires Contoso. On day one, Contoso users need Fabraham branding. In order to achieve that, Fabraham needs to share its Fabraham domain with Contoso. We have a user named Joni Sherman in the Fabraham tenant and a user named Grady Archie in the Contoso tenant. Grady is assigned with an email address that has the Fabraham domain. Later, the IT admin will consolidate tenants by migrating Contoso users into Fabricam. Here, we are migrating Grady's mailbox to the Fabricam tenant. After he's migrated, Grady continues to send and receive emails using the same email address. The contents of his inbox are preserved, and he can reply to threads that were started before he was migrated. We have set up the shared domain, which is emanate.fabricam.com. On the left is the Microsoft Admin Center of the source tenant, which is the tenant that the domain is shared with. And on the right is the Microsoft Admin Center of the target tenant, which is also the only tenant of the domain. As you can see, the shared domain shows in the source tenant has the status of shared from another organization. Now let's see how mail delivery works before the mailbox migration. We're using Outlook Web App for this demo. Now I'm in Joni's mailbox. As you can see, the UPN is in mna.fabricamp.com domain. And when we open her profile, it is also the primary SMTP. Now let's send an email from Joni to Grady's shared domain email address. I have switched to Grady's mailbox, and we see the email is delivered successfully. Let's check Grady's UPN. The UPN is still the routing email address, but when we open his profile, the primary SMTP is the shared domain email address. Now I'm in Joni's mailbox. 
We see Grady replied, and the email is delivered successfully. When we open Grady's profile, we see it's from Grady's shared domain email address. To prepare for Grady's cross-tenant mailbox migration, we have created an organization relationship object in both the source and target tenants, Contoso and Fabricam. The organization relationship in Contoso has the move mailbox capability of remote outbound. And in the domains field, we have the tenant ID of the target tenant. The OF application ID that was created during setup authorizes mailbox migrations from Contoso to Fabricam and stores the encrypted secret for the migration endpoint. We also have the published scopes. This contains a mail-enabled security group that contains the list of users that the source tenant specifies that are allowed to move. In the target tenant, we have the reciprocal relationship with Contoso. It has a move capability of inbound set, and in its domains field, it has the tenant ID of Contoso, the source tenant. We have also created a migration endpoint with a remote tenant name of mto.contoso.com, our source tenant. We also have the application ID listed here as well. In this stage of our demo, it is now time to move our shared domain user, Grady Archie, from Contoso to Fabricant. The PowerShell window on my left shows Grady's mailbox object in Contoso, and the PowerShell window on my right shows Grady's mail user object in Fabricant. As you can see, Grady's exchange GUID has been set on his mail user object in the target tenant, and we have also created an X500 proxy there for his legacy exchange DN on the source. On Grady's mail user object in Fabricam, his external email address is currently set to Contoso, and his primary SMTP is our shared email domain, mna.fabricam.com. Grady's mailbox is now ready for cross-tenant mailbox migration. To move Grady's mailbox from Contoso to Fabricam, I'm going to log into the Exchange Admin Center for Fabricam. I'm going to add a new migration batch. We call this Grady A. He's going to migrate to Exchange Online. The migration type is cross-tenant migration. The prerequisites have already been met. We performed these in a previous step where we set up our trust relationships between the source and target tenants. We're going to select the migration endpoint we created previously. We are going to include Grady in a CSV file. He is listed here. The target delivery domain specified is going to be our shared domain, mna.fabricam.com. I will automatically start the batch. Batch creation is successful. Greedy's move has now completed successfully to Fabricam. And now that Grady has completed his migration to Fabricam, he is a mail user in Contoso with the primary SMTP address of the shared email domain. And he is a mailbox now in Fabricam. Now let's see how mail delivery works after the mailbox migration. Now that Grady has completed his migration to Fabricam, I am logged into his mailbox, and we are going to reply to Joni. And now we are logged into Joni's mailbox, and she just received her email from Grady. And we will reply back to Grady. Welcome. And to wrap up our demo today, I've logged back into Grady's mailbox in Fabricam. As you can see, his cross tenant mailbox migration completed successfully as all of his existing mail was migrated to his new tenant. And he did receive his reply from Joni. Joni and Grady's contacts are resolved, and Grady's email address has remained the same, his shared email domain, grady at mna.fabricam.com. Hope you enjoyed our demo. Thanks for watching. Great. So there you have it. That's our first demo of mailbox migration and domain sharing working together. Uh, this is something that we've heard from customers over and over again, and it's in very early private preview. So we do have capacity to work with people directly and uh, help you try this out. We'll paste some of the links in later. And you know, one of the key scenarios that we know this will help with is 
it's not just about users keeping their email addresses at, before and after migration. We envision that this will enable you to have smaller migration batches. Um, you know, if if you anybody who's tried to move, say, ten or twenty thousand mailboxes, where users need to keep their domains before and after migration, um, probably had either some dissatisfied customers because you couldn't do it, or a really challenging weekend where you had to move all users together, remove the domain from the source, and add it to the target. So. Uh, look forward to getting some usage on this one and some feedback from you as well. So with that, we're going to go into a deep dive of the domain sharing for email feature with Estelle, and uh, she'll explain a little bit more about how this feature works under the covers. Thanks, Rob. Um, so I'll start with domain sharing setup process since we um, didn't go over it in the demo, and uh, I'll go into a deep dive in the next few slides. So domain sharing not only can be used with uh, mailbox migration, but also it can be used indefinitely if you're not planning to consolidate those tenants. Or simply you just want the tenants to represent a common corporate brand. So domain sharing is currently in private preview. And if you'd like to try out this feature, we have to turn it on for you. So you can set it up on the uh, Microsoft Admin Center. So after the feature is enabled, the tenant that wants to share the domain, which by using the example in the demo um, is Fabraham, can simply go through the setup wizard and share a custom domain with a tenant. Then the tenant that the domain is shared with, which in this case is Contoso, needs to add the domain once the invitation is sent. So you can see um, domain sharing feature requires some level of collaboration between the Fabraham and Contoso admins. So after that, both admins need to log in to PowerShell to set up inbound connectors. Um, this only requires a simple commentlet to set up. So the inbound connectors allow the mail between the two tenants to appear internal and trusted. And I'll talk about it more in details in the next slide. And then the next step is our secret sauce, which is to create the routing objects in Fabraham. The routing objects, as the name suggests, are used to facilitate inbound mail routing, and they're also used to ensure address uniqueness. So routing objects can be either a mail enable user or contact. And here we're in the last step, which is simply to assign an email address that has the shared domain to a user in Contoso. Um, sorry, okay, so I wanna spend some time to um, go over the mail flow after the domain sharing is set up because we got this question a lot from our customers and that's a valid concern because we all of us want to make sure the mail can be delivered. So um, let's use the user example in the demo. So when a uh, email is addressed to a shared domain email address, which in this case is gradya at mna.fabraham.com, it will first come to Fabraham um, and the rules and the security settings, such as quarantine and anti-spam in Fabricam, will be applied to that mail. It then finds that routing address, excuse me, find that routing address which contains um, the routing address information. In this case, is gradya at mto.contoso.com. And then it forwards that mail to that email address. So here we use the term routing address to indicate the native address of Grady's mailbox. So for an outbound mail from Grady, it goes directly to the internet. So it doesn't go back to Fabricam and forwards the mail and go through all that. So here you can also set up an inbound connectors, like I mentioned earlier, between the two tenants. So there are several benefits of this inbound connector. So for example, emails will bypass anti-spam filters as if they're sent or received from the trusted tenants and meeting room booking requests will automatically respond to the requester as if they're internal to the tenant. Um, so we talked about routing objects which forward mail from Fabraham to Contoso. Um, there are two ways to create them. You can either create them manually or let the system automatically create them for you. 
However, the automatic routing object creation can only be used in the cloud-only environment. So uh, this slide basically just shows a guideline on when we can use that functionality. So in general, if Contoso is in cloud-only environment, then you can use that functionality. It not only creates the routing object for you, but also checks the address uniqueness before a shared domain email address is assigned. On the other hand, if Contoso is in hybrid environment, you have to manually create them in Fabraham tenant and ensure the address uniqueness yourself for the mail flow. Um, just a side note that this guideline is for the scenario where you want to use domain sharing indefinitely. Um, there is one thing uh, I like to mention if you want to use domain sharing with mailbox, mig uh, mailbox migration. Um, so if you want to use them for coexistence, um, at this stage, you have to manually create the routing objects yourself in Fabraham when you set up domain sharing. So it doesn't matter if Contoso is cloud only or hybrid. And when you're ready to migrate mailboxes, you need to make sure the target mail user fulfills the prerequisites for the migration. So for example, before you migrate Grady's mailbox, you need to configure the routing objects and make sure the UPN the, and the primary SMTP address for the mail user in the target tenant need to be uh, the shared domain email address. And then um, the external email address is the routing address of Grady's mailbox. So um, another note, if you are migrating a mailbox uh, in the other direction, which is from Febraham to Contoso, you don't need to configure mail users. Uh, all you need to do is to create them in Febraham, just like what you would do for a regular mailbox migration. Um, so I also like to mention that, oh, Rob, sorry, would you mind to go back to the last slide, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, so we understand there's a scenario where you also want to migrate the custom shared domains when you consolidate tenants. So we do realize the current domain migration process is uh, painful and it's not automated and requires a lot of domain downtime. Um, this is on the roadmap and we're actively working on it, but we at this time we don't have an estimated uh, delivery time on that um, when that feature will be available. So please know that uh, that painful domain migration process only applies to uh, the scenario where you want to migrate the shared domains from Fabraham to Contoso. So in the other case, so if you move the resources from Contoso to Fabraham and use Fabraham's, uh, Fabraham's domain as the shared domain, you wouldn't need to migrate the shared domain. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so like I mentioned before, domain sharing is in private preview and it's a pre-release feature. So the technical details for general availability might be changed based on the customer feedback. Um, if you'd like to participate in our program, um, please fill out the form provided here and register your interest. Uh, we also have documents for cross-tenant mailbox migration and identity mapping ready. So check them out if you're interested. Um, now back to you, Rob or Georgia. Thank you. Sure, thanks Estelle. So uh, that concludes the material that we are going to cover today. And it's been great to see a lot of Q&A flying by in the chat. It's honestly been going uh, by too fast for me to, to keep up with it while we're coordinating the slides. Um, so we can uh, take some Q&A here for 10 or 15 minutes uh, about the content that we presented. But I also wanna highlight that the, our whole team is getting together at the top of the next hour for a dedicated uh, Ask the Experts session. So we actually have not just the next 10 or 15 minutes, but a whole 45 to 15 minutes after that. So if we don't get to your question here, please come to that session too, and we can, it'll be interactive and we can, we can talk about whatever you'd like to ask about, not just the contents of this presentation. Um, but with that, uh, there are so many questions that whizzed by. I'm inclined to ask folks to, if, you've, if you wanna now get your question addressed, 
and we haven't responded in the chat. Could you raise your hand if you don't mind and uh, come off mute and we can we can have a conversation about your questions. So David's got a really fast uh, finger. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I was waiting on that one. Thank you. Um, what's the impact of having a mail enabled user on the target side to other workloads like Teams and other uh, uh, apps that, that that use the substrate? Are they going to have to wait uh, until the mailbox is migrated over to the target to become useful? Or could a user get over there and start using them ahead of their mailbox migrating? Georgia, do you want to take a first stab at that one and then uh, I can yeah. add some context too? Yes. Um, okay, so um, with without a mailbox, the, the features like Teams and SharePoint, uh, they, they are still available in the target tenant, even without a mailbox. Um, as long as the mail user is um, is licensed to use uh, Exchange, it will work. OK. And then and it, um, it, it oh, will create a mailbox automatically because you have, a, I guess, the uh, source GUID yes. on there. Yeah. Right, so correct. Right. As long as you copy over the uh, the exchange GUID from the source tenant to the target tenant where the mail user exists prior to licensing that user in the target tenant, we won't automatically provision a new empty mailbox. Perfect, thank you. You're very welcome. And, and then I'll just add, David, because this, this was on the roadmap slide and we, we talked about it pretty quickly, that we do hear a lot of feedback from customers that they actually want to use this mail user object for resource access. I'm actually uh, curious about your situation, whether you would tend to give users their username and password of this destination mail user ahead of time, or if, or if that just happens in concert with the mailbox migration. But the idea behind the single sign-on uh, item on the roadmap is that a lot of customers said, hey, you're creating this mail user, we'd really like it to be an Azure AD B2B user so that before the migration, <clears throat> users can be added to Teams, be given access to documents, all the stuff that Azure AD B2B can do, and then they can migrate and they still have access to the stuff that you granted them to. You don't have to re-permission stuff in the destination. So that's what that roadmap item is, is uh, looking at. Um, this is in the realm of just being transparent, it's in the realm of proof of concept right now, and we don't have the all the steps working end to end for it to be ready for customers, but we have a lot of them working and we'll continue to focus on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, actually it does. It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Great, thanks for your question. So next uh, with the hand up, we've got Jason Ware. Hi, Jason. Hello. Um, I want to know about DKIM signing when you're doing a shared domain scenario where the target shares a domain with the source. So you got a use source user with the new target domain, example.com. When they reply to an email, it sounds like it goes directly outside out from their tenant instead of routing through our the target tenant to go out. How would you DKIM sign for the target domain then in that situation? Yeah, so the way good question. The way that works under the covers is you set up DKIM for, let's say uh, in, in the, it was Fabricam.com, you know, emanated.fabricam.com an example. <clears throat> so Fabricam sets up DKIM for that domain as usual uh, in the what we are calling the owning tenant. And then actually with domain sharing, no additional configuration is needed um, because outgoing mails from the tenant where the domain is shared will automatically be DKIM signed. They'll actually be signed with a different domain key, but the DKIM check will pass because D they, they are actually DKIM signed. So there's no additional step to make DKIM work, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, Mike, you've got your hand up. Mike Scott. I just have a quick question. Um, is this set of tools going to be uh, limited to, to the migration batch construct, or will we be able to use a uh, single user uh, mailbox move request in the future? Georgia, do you want to take that one? Yep, I got that one. Um, so, so it is limited to using new migration batch. 
um, new move request is not um, an option for doing a cross tenant mailbox move. But of course, you can put a single user in the batch. But yeah, just new migration batch is supported. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that people want to ask? Uh, Steve, go ahead. Hello. Um, is it possible to use domain sharing in exchange hybrid um, scenarios where um, the two orgs have their own uh, exchange hybrid? Uh, it, it's possible, and we, you know, we didn't talk about hybrid much here, but we do recognize that most customers of any size are still hybrid, have some hybrid presence. Um, so you can use domain sharing with hybrid identity where your users are synchronized from on-premises. And that's where um, the routing object management, as Estelle was talking about, you know, if you're cloud only, there's some tech that can do it for you. But if you're hybrid, you have to manage those routing objects and address uniqueness. That's a key consideration um, when you're hybrid and it's something we're taking feedback on and looking how we can make it easier. The, the key thing to call out is that right now you cannot assign a shared domain address to an on-premises mailbox. It's only available for the cloud mailbox, e even though the tenant itself can be hybrid. Okay, um, of course, we have a mix of, um, of uh, two customers who share the same domain right now, but they have a separate uh, mail gateway, but they want to um, get some kind of fusion in uh, Exchange Online, but there are around about 6,000 mailboxes, so it's not not fast to do. So we, um, so we tried if domain sharing would maybe a solution for, for um, consolidating the on-premise domains, but um, okay, so maybe we have a look. Um, we have a fast track engineer. Maybe we, we ask him some questions. Sure, yeah, and of course, on-premises exchange server has supported address rewrite capability for a long time, and that solution is available on-premises. Uh, domain sharing is only a cloud solution for cloud mailboxes. But yeah, work with your fast track engineer and they can contact us if they have more questions. Thank you. Uh, Jan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, hi. So what is the exchange on protection between those two tenants? Earlier we spoken anti-spam is not available, but what about other features of exchange on protection? Yeah, so actually um, the way that, that that should be explained is that all the rules that would normally run will still run in their same places. So when the mail comes into the owning tenant, if you're an EOP, if you have EOP and you've got E5 and all the, the anti-spam, anti-malware and so on features running, those features will run as the mail first came into the owning tenant. And uh, if they're triggered, obviously, then you know the mail will be, you know, the, the action will be taken right there. Um, but then, the, as Estelle's picture showed, mail is subsequently sent um, from the owning tenant forwarded to the tenant where the domain is shared. So if you've got rules configured, like I know you didn't ask about transport rules, but if transport rules are configured on the way out, they'll run. And then again, some rules will run on, like, on the way in. And where that gets interesting is like, what are the actual rules you have configured and will they be triggered or not uh, is, up to your own configuration, right? But those features will they they will run in all the same places they run today if you have mail forwarding coming into one tenant and forwarded to another. Uh, looks like is it Becky? Got your hand up? I was just curious for the mailbox migration after that's complete. Um, when you're migrating from hybrid to cloud in a in a direct environment, it just says you know close and reopen Outlook. For this cross tenant migration, will the users have to perform some manual tasks to update Outlook, or will there be a tool for that? So I can take that. Um, so today, uh, the user is required to make a new Outlook profile 
now um, and the OSD has to be resynced. Um, and it's not the same as a migration from, this is where it differs significantly from on-prem to the cloud, um, where you just get the pop-up, uh, essentially because in that migration, the UPN doesn't change. And in the migration from um, cross-tenant, it does, because you're actually moving to a new user object. Um, I was just actually typing in the chat, this is definitely um, a scenario feature that is on a roadmap that I didn't explicitly call out um, because this is probably in the top five of the requests that we get um, from our customers who have participated in a preview. How, how do we solve this problem? So, um, so, so we are looking into it. I just don't have a solution short term to share. OK, thank you. And, and one other quick end user thing sure. is Will the Teams meeting links, for, will those automatically update to be hosted from their, their target tenant account or will those links be broken? Those links are broken currently um, and the only way to correct that would be to edit the meeting request. Um, and the reason is, is because so we moved the calendar item as the calendar item itself and the, the content where the join meeting URL those coordinates that point back to the source tenant for um, joining that Teams meeting, they don't get updated automatically. So um, it is sort of a stale meeting request. But um, this is part of our roadmap for the Teams chat and media migration. So Teams meeting migration um, is that, you know, we want to build a feature that will go and um, uh, recreate those meetings so it's not required after migration. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for your question, Becky. Uh, Matthew, you've got your hand up. Does this currently affect anything in regards to any shared guest account access or anything with multi-tenant Azure Active Directory, or is it currently just limited to mail flow email? So, are you asking about domain sharing or mailbox migration or the whole all, all of the, it? The domain sharing, does it currently have any effect on Azure AD multiple tenants? Yeah, so there's there's two things there. Thanks for the question. The first thing that we heard, which I alluded to earlier, is these routing objects, we'd really like them to be Azure AD B2B objects so that users can access resources across tenants. And that's something that we don't have today, but it's on the roadmap and, and part of our overall story for multi-tenant organizations. So it's not there, but we're working on it to make it work. It's, it's on the roadmap. Um, the second thing, I'm trying to think, uh, what, what was the second part of your question? Does it affect anything in terms of if, the the mic user you're migrating or or moving over with those shared domains if something is shared cross tenant in that case like if a fabricam user has something shared with them from contoso in that example will that affect any of this right it, it, once we get it working it will but today the those those routing objects and the mail users for domain migration are not out of the box b2b users great thank you um, one other thing to call out, domain sharing is still in preview. It's pre-release software. There are limitations. Actually, one of the limitations is that uh, B2B invitations using the shared domain addresses right now fail. And we're working with our friends in Azure AD to get that scenario supported. Um, but in the current preview, you have to use the unique, what we're calling the routing address uh, to send B2B invitations. So. Just something to bear in mind as you, you try this out, there are still limitations that you, you need to work through. Um, I see we have one minute left. So Stefan, do you wanna ask your question and then we'll wrap it up? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, one question about uh, in the preview, have you seen any issues regarding mail loops when doing domain sharing? Um, I, I don't think we've seen any mail loops that didn't come from some kind of misconfiguration. We have seen some issues with NDRs and we work through them. And uh, like I know we're kind of almost out of time, so maybe in the next session we can talk about this more. Where domain sharing becomes more complicated is when customers want to keep using third party mail interception systems for scanning and so on um, with domain sharing and insert that in the path. And, and that's where sometimes you, you see uh, 
routing complexities that you need to work through. Thank you. But no, no loops per se. Thanks. OK, with that, uh, I apologize we didn't get to all of the questions. We are at time. But like I said, we have another session at 1 o'clock uh, Pacific time, so 10 more minutes from now, with no content other than just you asking us questions. So if you're interested in cross-tenant migration or multi-tenant organizations or data residency, that's what we cover in this team. Really appreciate your time here, and we look forward to uh, hearing your feedback as you use our products. Bye-bye.